Officials discovered that it was instead a close-up of an action figure named Cody, complete with a toy M16 held to his head. But no American soldiers had been reported missing, and an American toy maker noticed that the soldier was a ringer for its special ops action figure, Cody. When news coverage began to affect the action on the ground in the first Gulf War, the phenomenon was dubbed the CNN effect. Perhaps this was the beginning of the G.I. Joe effect. Communications, satellite systems, and unmanned drones backing up the ground troops as never before, allowing commanders to watch a battlefield hundreds of miles away in real time. It's like we fought the war in 1991, in the DOS era, in the paper era, and now we're fighting wars in the Windows era. The new virtual war has not only engendered new methods of state violence, but also new relationships between civil and military spheres. In 1997, for example, the Marines began using modifications of commercial games to train foot soldiers. The first of these was Marine Doom, a modification of the popular first-person shooter. The Army made use of Tom Clancy's Rogue Spear. A gaming experience. A quantum leap forward in battlefield simulation, states Game Informer. The game company Destineer followed suit in 2005 by releasing a marine combat simulator called Close Combat First to Fight. Folks in Iraq are seeing the symbols of Saddam Hussein come tumbling down. Now Americans are finding their own way to vent against the Iraqi dictator. Folks right here in the U.S. shooting paintballs at pictures of the Iraqi dictator. In Indiana, people are playing war games, pretending to be soldiers searching for him. The main feature of this new video game war is an interactive urge. Kelly Arena has her finger on the button. She'll literally blow up a truck to show us the explosive situations U.S. troops often face in Iraq and Afghanistan. Push it. Recognizing these new trends, the Pentagon naturally sought to capitalize on the new public appetite for war play. The Air Force began releasing recruitment ads whose main enticement was that 
someday we might be handed the controller. The image of crossing over is a useful way to understand the new culture of war games. These games routinely invite us to cross over and play virtual soldier in an increasingly militarized civil culture. 45-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Casey Wardinsky is in charge of Army Manpower. He's also the economist who came up with the idea of using a video game as a recruiting tool while brainstorming with entertainment executives in Los Angeles. I was trying to work through the economics of all this and I was uh, chatting with a friend at a cocktail party. He was in direct marketing and he pointed out how cheap it is to put like a videotape or a DVD in a house and uh, that really struck me as amazingly uh, a cost of a uh, sort of affordable way of doing business. And then the next thing was, well, why can't we put something more immersive in a house beyond a, a DVD or a tape, like a game? And then, voila, uh, it, it looked like it was doable. Nowhere is the militarization of culture more pronounced than with the Army's newest weapon in its recruiting arsenal, a video game called America's Army. The Army released the free game in 2001. Since then, it has been a runaway success with over six million registered users in 2005. America's Army introduced an entirely new relationship between the military and popular culture. This is not just any old war game. America's Army comes with a stamp of authenticity. The game's very existence advances the notion that war can be a form of entertainment, a leisure time activity. This sense was enhanced when the Army released a version of the game called Real Heroes. This game featured playable characters based on actual soldiers who had served in Iraq and elsewhere. With America's Army, the military had indeed conquered a new frontier. You're in, darling. You're in our mind. Uh, I found it interesting when folks say we're softening them up. We're not softening them up, we're killing them. So this is no video game, this is war. Defense officials tell Fox... These kinds of expressions date back to the first Gulf War. In 1991, Commanding General Norman Schwarzkopf told the press that war was not a Nintendo game. The need to say this, of course, signals the fact that war has come to look very much like a video game. As viewers of the TV war, we are treated to endless flyovers. We are immersed in a general spirit of play. We are shown countless computer animations that contribute to a sense of virtuality. We play alongside news anchors who watch on their monitors. We sit in front of the crosshairs directing missiles with a sense of interactivity. The destruction, if shown at all, seems unreal, distant. These repeated images foster habitual fantasies of crossing over. Mike Herbert remembers watching missiles like this one crash into targets on TV during Desert Storm. He was only a teenager. And to actually do that myself for the first time when I remember in high school seeing it on TV, on uh, being able to see that now to actually do it, it's, uh, it's a whole different world. So it is no surprise when the metaphor of the video game makes its inevitable appearance in debates regarding journalism and war. But if there's a war that's a Nintendo war, it was this one. We were basically playing some sort of almost a, a, right. a real virtual reality. Right. Except now we were, up at, now we're up at PlayStation is, yeah, we were there. That is it Nintendo. for the panel today. Douglas Rushkoff, thanks. Eduardo Braniff and Elizabeth. On this Stein. video game point, because Sony has already copyrighted the words shock and awe. They, uh. have, they've got a video game <laughs> coming out called exactly this. There's other Indeed. 30-odd companies eventually trademarked the phrase shock and awe. PlayStation manufacturer Sony was the largest of these, applying for its patent only one day after the spectacular bombing of Baghdad. Sony dropped the trademark a month later under threat of controversy. But this did not stop other game manufacturers from capitalizing on the war. 
Gotham Games aggressively advertised its Gulf War I-based game, Conflict Desert Storm, during the lead-up to the invasion. The company then went into full-scale production of the sequel, Conflict Desert Storm II Back to Baghdad. The game arrived in stores just six months after the 2003 invasion and still during the violent occupation. This time